everyone, I'm Linda Nickel and welcome to another session of my happiness hour. My goal here is to help us all connect, inspire and create. We do this every Wednesday night live here on Zoom with a new topic and a new speaker. I post the list of upcoming presentations on, on Tuesdays to my Instagram page at Cousin Linda and on my website at lindanickel.com. Um, there you're going to find a little bit more of a detailed description for each of those classes. If you're joining us for the first time tonight and are wondering what you've missed out on, you can find all of these sessions, all the previous sessions on YouTube, which are linked from my website. The lady that keeps me on track is Erin Randall, who is in Montana at the moment. So say hello, Erin. Hello, Erin. <laughs> so our guest this evening is Stephen Mack of Nomis Photography based in New York. Stephen has a background in graphic design, computer animation, video production, and web design. Ladies Home Journal and DuJour.com are just a couple of places his work has been published. Stephen is primarily a portrait photographer, but his lifestyle, food, and event work keep him busy as a full-time photographer. About a month ago, one of Stephen's still life images slipped into my Instagram feed. I was truly, um, and sincerely want to say this, I was truly captivated by it. It was a photograph of these huge white poppies that were spilling out of this beautiful knotted sculpture. It was simply stunning. And if you haven't um, visited his website or his Instagram page, please go look for that. Um, I was compelled to invite Stephen to come out, to come on and do a presentation on how he, how he creates his images. And, um, you know, I was, I was just tickled that he said, sure, I'll do it. And so he's going to walk us through a presentation on how he creates a still life fine art images. And um, Stephen, I've already said this, I've gushed a little bit, but I just really want to thank you for coming on. And it, it takes a little bit of time out of your day, but uh, it means the world to me. So welcome, and I'm going to pass, pass this over to you. Linda, thank you so much. That was um, really a wonderful intro. Um, I actually have plenty of time on my hands, so it's it's really it's really great to be here with everybody. I think you've built a really wonderful community. It was nice to meet everybody in the beginning. And actually, Linda, you're in luck because that image that you saw is the one I'm going to go through tonight. So I'm going to take you through how I shot it, how I came up with the idea, um, how I composed it, and how I retouched it. So the, we're going to start off kind of a little as an overview, how I got into still life by accident uh, or by circumstance, I should say. And then um, we're going to take you through some different ones that I've done, the ideas behind them and that sort of thing. And, and then it's going to start a little general and then it's going to get a little technical. And this isn't really a tutorial presentation. Um, so I'm going to be moving very quickly through things. I'm going to be clicking things on and off. You're going to wonder, I mean, wait until you see my Photoshop screen. It's a little overwhelming, but, uh, but if you have questions about anything, I, I will answer them. Feel free to jump in at any time. It's, it's totally fine. And I'm happy to go back to anything that I talk about as well. Just jump right in, get started. I'm going to share my screen here. And um, Again, my name is, uh, you can see this okay, my name is uh, Stephen Mack. I'm a photographer in New York City. Although since March, I've been spending my time in upstate New York where I have a place uh, near Hudson, which is about two hours north of the city. I have a background in graphic design, corporate branding, I've done some advertising. Uh, also then went into doing IT consulting for a number of years and about three years ago, left that because it was completely soul crushing. I do have one client that I still work with from time to time to become a full-time photographer. So uh, I picked up a camera. I mean, I've always been using a camera, but picked up in earnest to try to make some money out of it and got into portraits and headshots, events, food, lifestyle type stuff. I mean, I'll never forget my first um, Instagram lifestyle shoot. A chef called me up and said, I need you to follow me around New York, taking pictures of me doing grocery shopping and on the subway, I'm like, but, but I don't understand why, like, why are we doing this? And, uh, but it was a lot of fun. So um, I just enjoy taking pictures and 
uh, hope to make money out of it. Now, things were going really well until COVID hit and we, New York shut down early as everybody knows, uh, came upstate in the middle of March. And this is pretty much where I've been ever since. And I really wasn't sure what to do with my time. And I decided to start doing some still lifes, try to, what can I do in my home? And that's the title of this uh, presentation. It's still life in quarantine and how to create meaning with what you have, which I kind of think is sort of poetic for this time is sort of taking stock of what you have and what can you do with what you have uh, to transform it into something. And that's what this, this presentation is going to be. My Instagram is down there. My website is down there as well. Um, I am on Facebook, although I don't go on it that much. Uh, it's, I find it a little overwhelming. So I'm, I'm on Instagram a lot. So Instagram, my website, those are great places to email me. I love answering questions. Please reach out if you have any questions, even after this presentation, it is absolutely my pleasure. Uh, I have been blessed by people who have helped me and I feel a very strong obligation to pay that forward. So um, we are going to, uh, so it's sort of gonna be three sort of sections here. We're gonna talk about ideas and concepts, then get into sort of the technical bits about how I shoot and really design. I mean, I do think of designing a shot and then post-processing. And uh, so, so what we're going to do now is I'm gonna exit um, the keynote and let me see, let me just stop my sharing. I accidentally shared that one screen. I need to share my entire desktop. Give me one moment. Okay, so, you know, the fun thing about, about uh, still lives is you can really just take your own time. You know, if you're shooting nature, you're shooting people, you're shooting families, weddings, I don't care what it is. There's just a lot of pressure to, to get it done. You know, you've got other people to worry about. Maybe the weather is changing. And, and what's nice about still life and taking this time and what I found is I could just slow down. I could look around my home and say, well, what do I have? What could I do something with? Could I tell a story? And that's what this is about. So I highly recommend if you've never done it before, regardless of the type of photography that you do, that you give this a try. I think it, it can be really rewarding. So this image that's up right now is the first one that I did. And um, I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen so you can see me again. And I had lying around the house, I bought them years ago, these really sort of fun little ceramic pieces uh, for their little vases that I had. And I always thought they were kind of fun and goofy. And I found them at a store in New York. And I thought, you know, they're kind of like little characters. And I thought, well, what if I did little scenes with them where the flowers sort of express the emotion of the um, vases in a way. And so uh, let me put this back up here. So these, these three here, the title of this one is Envy, and I'm gonna do something that no artist should ever do, is I'm gonna over explain their work. And uh, so the scene here is that these two little vases here are kind of together and this third one sort of to the right is envious of the other two. So I, made them sort of similar in the flowers that they have. I gave different flowers to the one on the right. It's sort of pulling away, but wants to look back and is sort of envious or jealous. And then I even made the background green. You know, we associate green with envy. So there's a greenish tint to the background, which also makes the magenta of the flowers pop because that's its complementary color. So I'm always trying to think of, of color and, and composition uh, in, in my work. So I'm gonna just go on to the next one. This was, this was the second one that I did and I actually did it the same evening. Um, I was in that first image, I saw those two vases together. I thought, well, it's really kind of interesting how they're so close. And then I said, well, let me just put them closer. And I looked at this, I thought, well, it's just like, it's sort of like people in love or, or two little beings in love and, and how they come together and form one. So the, the idea here is you see the two vases, you see the separation, but when they join in this way, it becomes sort of one 
um, one sort of unit of the flowers, uh, which I was was really drawn to, and I thought that was that was quite nice. And then the final one in this little series uh, I called Hide and Seek, and the idea behind this is that this little guy on the right here was playing a joke, and you see this this yellow flower sort of stole a piece of the one on the left and is hiding it from him, so it's sort of in shadow. And then the kind of the expression I see in these purple magenta flowers is like, you know, like, what? What do you mean? I didn't take anything. And look, none of this comes across in Instagram. I don't explain this in Instagram. This is my thinking behind the scenes about uh, what I had in mind. And I feel that even though people may not get it, don't see it, don't really care, it informs me and gets me excited about what I'm doing. And it gives me some sort of um, um, emotional connection to the piece because that's what I want to do. I want to have a little something else going on under the surface than just the image itself. So one image I did after this, which was really popular and a little more on the nose, this was right when quarantine was in full force and I had all these beautiful tulips. I didn't really know what to do with them. And, and I had this cloach also hang around the house. I put up a beautiful Oliphant backdrop. Um, Oliphant is a company in Brooklyn that makes gorgeous hand-painted canvas uh, backdrops for portraits and still life and whatever. So I put that in the background. That's my dining room table. And I put the cloach um, there and, and I had just this tulip and I was bending it and I was steaming it so it become more flexible. And got this shot and um, kind of sat with it. So that's really interesting and did some work on it. And this one is titled Trapped. And people, when I posted this, really responded to it. I think it sort of hit at the right moment. People were feeling like this, uh, that they were trapped. And uh, yeah, so then uh, let's go a little further here. One second. Um, uh, let me go the other way. Okay, so this one was actually a different idea that I had. Now, there's no particular meaning behind it or anything like that, but this this kind of leans more to the graphical side. Uh, I'm really into the symmetry of this, the contrast between the softness of the tulip and then the hardness of the what is actually, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second just to show you, it was a bookend. So I had this bookend here, this kind of funky brass thing, and and I had the flower sort of going through it like this, and I couldn't, you know, I was photographing it a bunch of different ways. I didn't like it. And I said, oh, I'm just gonna put it on its side. And I put it on its side, and I stuck the tulip uh, in it like that. And I said, wow, I think I really got something pretty there, just really striking. And um that's uh that's how i came up with that one and let me just keep on going here real quick i want to make sure we've got time out of time uh this is another one that i did again with those same little vases and this one's titled distance again people had to social distance and i was thinking well how can i sort of convey that with flowers and um i used this gold backdrop this is a gold leaf backdrop also from oliphant this is very small. It's only maybe four feet by five feet or something. And uh, wanted the gold again, complementary color to the purple, it really makes the purple pop. So it really gives that extra impact. And keep going. And then this is the, um, before we get to that image, I just want to talk about this one. You know, not everything has to have a story. I think this image was interesting. I had no plans on doing it. I had a bunch of flowers and this tulip was really big, white, striking. It was sort of past its peak and it had this waxy quality to it. And I thought, wow, this is just really pretty. And I said, I just want to emphasize the beauty of it with some really wonderful lighting on this black, this is again, my dining room table, this black bamboo dining room table. And I just took this shot, but I had no plan on doing it. So. So even if you can't come up with an idea, you know, for maybe a scene or something, find something that strikes you 
you know, and what is it about that thing that strikes you? Is it the color? Is it the texture? Is it a pattern? And how can you emphasize it? How can you really call attention so that others see the beauty that you see in it? And that's um, what I was trying to do with this one. And, and this one, I, I really do plan to, to print quite large. I think like five feet by four feet or something would be really quite stunning. Um, so that's what I plan on doing there. So, and then I'm finally, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Stephen, uh, while we're here, someone's asking, how are these being lit? Do you mind answering that? Sure, I'm actually gonna, yeah, I'll talk okay, a little bit I'm more about the lighting in a minute. Yeah. Um, this is just kind of an overview of the concepts, but, but basically I've got, so I'll talk a little bit about gear because I know we're all interested in that. I shoot on a Nikon Z7. I've always been a Nikon shooter. Um, I had the D850 before the Z7. I really like to push and pull my images a lot. Uh, at the time, I don't know if it's still the same, the, the Nikon D850 had pretty much the highest dynamic range in a full frame um, DSLR. And now the Nikon Z7 pretty much has the same sensor. So I suck with that. And I love the whole mirrorless thing. I mean, I could talk forever about that. I'm a huge gearhead. Uh, and I try to stop myself from being that way, but I'm on DP review all, all the time reading reviews. So I have that as my camera. And then I also have two Profoto B10s. Um, that's what I have with me here upstate. Uh, most of these were shot with a three foot um, Octabox with diffusion. And then I would usually have a V flat or maybe uh, some sort of umbrella fill light. And I'm gonna talk much more about this later, but that's typically how I light. I light in a very classic sort of Rembrandt Dutch master style with the, the you know, light at sort of 45 degrees up in the corner down and then a fill behind me, behind the camera. And I have some, some photos I'll show. Uh, should I keep going or is there any more questions up to this point? No, that was the only one I was saying. Okay. All right. So, so this is the photo I'm going to talk about tonight. And um, these were, I'm sorry, Linda, these are anemones. They're not poppies. Oh, uh, I thought they were poppies. OK, thank you. That's fine. And uh, this, uh, this photo, um, I had this really weird sort of brass sculpture thingy on a shelf. I mean, literally, it was like way up high on a shelf, and I didn't know what I was going to do with it. But I thought, wow, it'd be really kind of neat if I wove some flowers through it. Maybe that's something I could do. Um, why not? And I was just waiting for the right set of uh, flowers to do that with. And I picked up these anemones that were in season. They had beautiful long stems. And I thought, you know what? This is what I'm going to try with. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch to uh, capture one here. Now, I shoot in Capture One. Um, you can use Lightroom, of course. I use Capture, I've used both. I use Light uh, Capture One because I really like the tethering features of it. And for those of you that don't know what tethering is, it allows you to connect your camera to a computer. And as soon as you take the shot, the image goes right to your computer and right into the program so that you can see on a nice big monitor exactly what you're getting. And you can make adjustments. I can adjust exposure, shadows, contrast, whatever, and it'll apply that to the next shot. So if I have some ideas in mind for processing, I can explore those as I'm shooting, which is really uh, exciting. And then Lightroom can do the same thing. Um, what I don't think Lightroom does uh, is uh, live camera view. So I have this ability, my camera's not hooked up now, I'm not gonna go through all of that, but this button right here actually turns Put, brings in a video feed of what my camera is seeing. So in real time, I can adjust flowers and whatnot and see in real time what my composition is gonna be like, which is super helpful, especially with still lifes like this. Now, the one other thing I wanted to tell you that, and, and Lightroom has this feature as well, uh, Capture One has this feature for overlays. And as I may have mentioned, um, Composition is incredibly important in my work. I spend a lot of time focusing on that. And I use still lifes as a way to practice, train my eye, so that picking up those compositional cues 
are a little bit more intuitive when I'm out in the field or photographing people and I don't have time to really sit and move a flower exactly. So I'm actually, I, I forgot to do this. I'm gonna jump back into Photoshop real quick because I just wanna show you what I'm talking about here. Um, so let me go back here. I'm gonna, now you're gonna see my Photoshop workspace. So just, uh, we'll get into that later. Uh, so I'm going to overlay something here and I hope you can see it, but you see all these grid lines. Now this is called the harmonic armature. And basically it divides the, a, a rectangle into harmonics, into thirds, into quarters. And you know we've talked about the rule of thirds. Uh, many people know that it's a very common sort of basic comp, uh, uh, compositional technique, but this is even beyond that. So this is, where can you have things fall on lines? Where can you have, you know, um, significant uh, intersections of, of, uh, of points and focus? So in this, um, you can see here, I've got these flowers lined up a bit on this line. The, this line of the table, or it's actually a bench, is right at the third mark here. Uh, so I try to split things up and have things be in different quadrants and angles and have flowers be in points of the image that are at, focal, at points where lines interact. And this sort of stuff is very important to me. I'm just going to show you, um, uh, not this, actually, yeah, I even did it in this one. Hold on, let me show you. So you can see it's a little hard to see on the screen, but there's an in, uh, intersection here. Then there's this line, this triangle, the, you know, the flowers are kept in this triangle here. And all this stuff for me sort of adds to the beauty of the image and, and helps me compose something that's pleasing. And a lot of master painters um, use this technique. Uh, you can search dynamic symmetry or harmonic uh, armature online and you'll find a lot of stuff like this, especially on Pinterest and you'll see where people overlay lines on, on old paintings, uh, uh, street photography and, and whatnot. So this is, this is my time to play with this sort of thing. So I, I'm just showing you that I'm gonna go back to Capture One because um, what Capture One allows me to do is I can click show and it'll overlay this for me. So as I'm composing my shot, I can put this on top of it and see if I'm getting things just right. I'm gonna turn that off now. Okay, so what I'm gonna take you through here, and this is, I didn't realize I even had all these images. I'm gonna show you how I went through lighting this scene. So this first shot is literally me with the background, with the sculpture, with a sort of a console table there, and there's no flash, there's no nothing. This is just natural light. Then I put the flash on, it was too dim. I'm not using any light meters, I honestly, really don't see a need in this day and age. Everything is what you see is what you get. And um, so I just do everything by eye. So this is a beauty dish with a 15 degree uh, grid on it. And I'm gonna have a, I have a picture of this later on that I'll show you that set up. So I just turned on the beauty dish. I played with the brightness and I was, okay, is that too bright? And well, should I move it down? You know, do I like where the hot spots are? Do I like the angle? Now here, I wanna show you the difference between these two. So you notice now there's this highlight here, and that is because I added a V flat to the left. So if you don't know what that is, a V flat is basically just a large piece of foam core, uh, usually white on one side and black on the other. So I put a white V flat on the left to give me a little bit of a highlight. So just to bring out some detail, and you can see, you know, these are this is an interesting, um, well, it's debatable if it's interesting, but it's a sculptural piece. It's made out of metal. How can I bring out some more detail? So I brought I brought in that B flat, put it to the left, and I get that nice these nice highlights here. So I'm just going to keep going, and I just kind of amp the light up a little bit. I change the background. I move the background a little bit. This I'm just playing with some focus. You know, just kind of trying to tweak it. And then there's no magic here. I'm just doing it. Now, if you notice here, the light really does start to change. Um, what I've added now is a fill light behind me. So I have a fill light behind me that's, that's kind of just overall lighting the whole scene. And again, I'm gonna show you a picture of that in a little bit. 
I'm just going to go down a little bit. And now it's like, well, I'm going to start adding some flowers now. But you notice here that is not an anemone. So the reason why is after a while, when you play with flowers, they start to will, they start to droop, they become quite annoying to deal with actually. So, you know, you have to kind of work quickly. So I was testing some out with some uh, tulips that I had. And again, too bright. And I'm just sort of going through. I'm going to skip some of this because, oh, and then for some reason, I brought in some honey that I had because I wanted to see how the highlights looked on the honey. I wasn't going to use the honey, but I just wanted to see something that had more shading and different materiality to it. Um, then I brought in a vase that I had and I was just kind of playing. And that's what I recommend you do. This is just an opportunity to try things, what looks good. You know, no one's there to say you're doing it wrong. You can just try things. And I'm really showing you behind the curtain here. This is a, this is olive oil that I had and I just put in there to see what that would look like. And then I stopped playing around and then I was like, okay, so this is a, um, pull back a little bit of what I had. And actually, I don't think I have the fill light in here yet, but there's the V flat on the left, it's my computer with the tether cable. And then there's a, um, actually in this case was not a, uh, a beauty dish. This, at this point I was using this uh, Octabox here. That's a three foot Octabox with diffusion, sorry. Um, and I'm just gonna keep zooming down or else we're gonna be here forever looking at this. See, there's a lot of, that, okay, so so um, so now actually you can sort of see here this this sort of disc here. This is when I did move to the um, to the beauty dish, and let me just pull that up here. So this is actually what my final setup was. So I said to myself, okay, you know what? I don't need the V flat. So I flipped the V flat around, and it was black. I moved the octa box to behind me, so the octa box became my fill. And the, the beauty dish with the, gr the grid, with the 15 degree grid, became my, um, my key light. So this is, this is the setup. And there's my camera and there's the tether cable. And then you can see my computer down here on the bottom. So I just wanna show you that. So that's where we're going. I think we're gonna get there eventually. So this is, um, again, me kind of playing a little bit, just trying some things. Now I, I move the camera vertical because now I was ready to kind of think about composition a little bit and what I wanted to do. I wasn't really happy with these. Again, shifting the light around, let's skip all this. Okay, so again, now, now the lighting is becoming something I was really liking. So I took the flowers out, was still shifting the light around, as you can see between these two, like where do I want the hot spot? Do I want it more to the left or to the right? You know, these are the things I spend my time thinking about, but. Uh, this is the time to do it. It's fun. So now the flowers start going in there. And I know this is like all of a sudden, where did, how did all these get here? And unfortunately, what I don't have are all the little steps I did to get here. Because um, Capture One has a feature called uh, composition mode, I believe it's called. Yeah, composition mode right here, you can see. And what that does is it means you can take a picture, but it won't save the picture. It's not gonna just keep saving pictures to your hard drive. The idea is you can keep taking photos, so you can see it, but then it's gonna just erase it every time you click the button to do a new one. So you can just play with composition. So I had done that, and then I got to this point. At this point, I was thinking, okay, I feel like I'm really close. So here's my symmetry grid up. There's a lot of things I liked. Um, I liked how this flower was on the edge here. I had this one kind of centered at this intersection point, but it's super droopy. I like where this one was going. I loved this one on the top, on the top left, how it was sort of going away from the group. And then I love this strong one here. So then as you can see, I started moving them around. This was incredibly frustrating. They would fall, they would slip. Um, just going every which way. You see them sort of moving around, almost like they're dancing. And, um, and then I started to get here. And this was pretty much the final image uh, with a couple of caveats. Now, you can't see it here, but I'll show you. There's, um, there's some blue here, some tape I put in. Uh, but this, this, I was, this was it. I had a feeling this was it. I actually taped down this flower. You couldn't see it on the other side. I, I pushed down the stem so that the flower face would pop up. 
and face directly towards the camera. But I was really liking what was happening here. So now what I'm going to show you is once, once I got this set up, notice that I'm, we're going to get a little technical. Notice that I'm focused uh, right at the front of this flower because I'm going to use a technique here called focus stacking. And if you're not aware of what focus stacking is, a lot of cameras have this feature built in where you take a series of images at different focal lengths and you focus at the very front and then you start, the camera automatically focuses further and further back until it hits, you know, the last thing you want in focus. And then in software, there is specialized software that will merge, you can do it manually in Photoshop, but I use something else which I'll talk about, which will merge all those images so you have a perfectly sharp image from front to back. And this is commonly used in macro photography and in landscape photography. Uh, I'm gonna get a little technical here for a second, but a lot of times people think that, oh, I'm just gonna put my aperture to like F22 and then everything will be in focus. Well, fortunately, um, there's sort of a sweet spot for sharpness in a lens and it's usually kind of in the middle um, of your aperture. If you go too far, to, to close too far down, you have a phenomenon called diffraction, which is where light actually becomes spread out through the, through the aperture and you actually get blurrier images instead of sharper images. So, uh, so I'm all about quality. I'm all about the biggest image I can get, the sharpest image I can get when I'm doing things like still life. So that's why I do this focus stacking technique at an aperture on my camera. I think I was using a 24 to 70 millimeter Nikon um, Z lens for this. And I think it was like at F, I mean, I can kind of pull it up here and show you, see what my settings were. Um, yeah, I was at F7, I think around F7, 8, 8, 9 or whatever is what's good for, for my camera is at 42 millimeters there. So this was the composition that I liked. And then I took my focus stacking set. So what you're seeing here, this is, these are the images that are going to become my final image. So this front part is perfectly in focus. And then as I'm going to zoom in here, as I click in, so it might be hard to see on zoom, but now this is in focus. And then the focus starts slowly moving back. Sorry, then moving back. And then now, now this stem is perfectly in focus. And it just keeps going all the way back um, until I get to the backdrop. And I want to talk about that in a second. I'm just going to keep scrolling down here. Somewhere the backdrop is like perfectly in focus. There we go. Yeah, so this is the focus stacking. It's just my camera just going through in regular increments, very consistent, and then taking image after image. So, okay, so once that's done, I take all these images and I drop them into a program called Helicon Focus. Um, it's H-E-L-I-C-O-N. And what it does is it analyzes them all and merges them to all together to give me one image. And I'm gonna show you that one. Now I'm not gonna show you Helicon Focus because it'll, it's automatic, but it's gonna to take too long for it to do its thing. So let me go back to Photoshop. I'm gonna to go to, um, second. Lindy, any questions at this point? Or yeah, I just so let me, let me throw this one because we're right here. How many focus stacking images are we talking about here? That is such a good question. And I don't have an answer for you on that. And it, it's different. It depends on, it just, it just depends. Um, on these, I think I, I took a lot, but I think I only needed to do um, 15, or 15 or 20 or so, I think. I think it, it just depends on so many variables. If you're doing a landscape, it's gonna be different. If you're, you know, super close and then going to something really far back, it's gonna be more, you know, whatever your, the focal range that you're going is gonna determine how many images. And then you have to worry about, well, how many increments should you do? And I kind of overdo it. I know some people can do it with just like five images and I did it with 20. Um, but, you know, better safe than sorry. I wasn't gonna get a lot of time with these flowers, so I didn't wanna push yeah. it. Um, and so there's a question, why um, did you use, why, why not use the stacking in Photoshop? Just so my understanding with the stacking in Photoshop, it's a manual process. I don't think 
there's automatic focus stacking in Photoshop. I think you have to manually go through the images and choose like which parts you want and and you have to you know reveal them with layer masks and what I, I just like it's gonna give me a headache and I definitely don't want to do that. Can you repeat the stacking software name again? Sure. Yeah. Let me let me just pull it up one second. I'll show you. There it is. So is it it's um, yeah, it's um, yeah. So it's heliconsoft.com, and um, see if they have like a. Well, you can go here and see it. There's a gallery here. Uh, it's used a lot for, like I said, for macro photography and all sorts of different things, and they just talk about all the kind of stuff you can do with it. It's it's great. I mean, it's really neat. I mean, you can look at this image of this um, shotgun here. It's like perfectly in focus and then perfectly in focus in the back. So that's what I use. Okay, one last question and then I'll sure. let you move on. Um, sure. So it goes back to the overlay. Um, can yeah. you get that overlay in real time as you're arranging the flowers? Will it show you where the PowerPoints appear? Is that uh, in real time or? So sorry, can it can I sure. see it in real time? I think the, yeah, I think the question is with that overlay. Yeah. Back in I think it was Capture One. In Capture One, uh, this right here. Right. Can you get that in real time and you can see where the points are when you're putting the flowers? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. So so yes. Yeah, sorry. So I see the question. So when you use Live View here, so when I have my camera connected, and I hit Live View, and I'm seeing a video of my image. I do get these lines. So I can move things into position with these lines over the video um, from the camera. Super helpful, it really is. Okay, I lied, there's one more question. Sure, uh, sure. Is the focal point a set distance that you choose or is it unadjustable? Oh, such a good, wait, so you mean the focal point of the camera before I do the focus stacking? I think, let's see, is the focal point a set distance? I think he's talking about Probably. your, your subject. So yeah, no, it's not. So, so the only the important thing in focus stacking is you need to make sure you start at least the way my Nikon works is it starts from the nearest point and then goes back, but it doesn't know what the back point is that I want to stop at. It only knows the starting position. So that's what's tricky. I never know. Like, for example, on, on this one, I actually go, I went too far. I'm actually past the backdrop in focus. So I actually only needed to do to like, I don't know, here or something, somewhere up here. But but you just have to kind of play with it. So you, you pick the starting point, and then it's just going to go back as many steps as you tell it to. So that's the trick. That's where you don't really know how many to do. Some cameras, you can set the front focus point and the back focus point, and it'll just go between those two. But unfortunately, the Nikon doesn't do that. OK. So. Um... One more question. That's fine. That's fine. The harmonic armature. I think yes. that um, somebody's a little confused. She said that she kind of missed it. She goes, the lines are an option in your camera as an extra layer. Is no, no, sorry. This, this is not, um, this is not part of any camera, anything. This is a graphic. So, so basically you can make this on your own. You can make this if you have a program like Adobe Illustrator or even Photoshop, all you're doing is you're just connecting lines to all the different corners and to the midpoints of each side. That's it. So, I, so for example, if I'm just going to take this top right corner here, I'm just drawing this line to here, then I'm drawing a line to this corner, and I'm drawing a line to here. And then I do that all the way around, and it creates this. So I created this for myself in, um, um, in uh, Illustrator, and I saved it out as a uh, 1.5 vertical. That's the aspect ratio of this camera. And then I can just pull it in. And I have, one, I have different ones here. I have a horizontal one for when I do horizontal. I do, here's one for a four by five, uh, a 4.5 ratio image. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, how, that's how it is. So this is not something that's in camera. My camera doesn't do this. This is a graphic that I, um, I put in. You created. Okay. Okay. We're yeah. good. Great. And you know what I'm, I'm happy to do? I don't know. Uh, I can put this, this actual file on Dropbox and people can download it if they'd like and yeah, use it and whatever. Um, yeah. If you're willing to do that, I'll figure out a way to 
make sure, sure. it's shared. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to just uh, go back to Photoshop. Um, okay. All right. So, so now, um, okay. So for some reason, my mouse isn't clicking. That's super strange. Um, hold on one moment. Let me sure. uh, stop screen sharing. Maybe that'll, okay. well, I can't stop screen sharing because my mouse doesn't work. Okay. Let me try this. I'm going to switch to my Wacom tablet and see if, Okay, so my tablet works, so we're gonna just use that. Perfect. So, but I do wanna use my mouse. Let me just turn that off and then I'll just turn it back on in a second. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna open this up. So Helicon Focus generates a raw file from all my raw files, which is great. So I don't lose any quality. I still get a perfectly sharp, so I'm gonna really zoom in here so you can see this image. So here's the front, super, super sharp, super sharp all the way back to the point that you can actually see the weave of the canvas of the backdrop. Now, one thing I'll point out here that happens with focus stacking, I'm gonna to try to find a good example of, okay, here we go. There's some strange sort of artifacts here. You can see it's sort of maybe hard to see. Maybe I can zoom in a little bit more. There's some, like a, like a blurriness here. Uh, so it's not perfect. So this, these are, this sort of haloing um, is something that can happen and you can change settings to fix it, but then I just go in Photoshop and I clean all that up. Now, so I have my, I have my raw, now we're getting to the post-processing part. I have my raw file and in here I've done some basic adjustments like I would in Lightroom or any camera raw processor. So I'm just tweaking the, the settings a bit. So I lowered my highlights. So for example, let me see if I can get my mouse to work because working with the pen like this is not, uh, not preferable. Let's see, okay, can we click? Yes, okay, so we're back. First rule in IT is just reboot it. So um, let me just get this out of the way, okay. So I'm going to reset. Let me see if I, uh, um, I'm going to reset all my settings here. Oh, it's not resetting it for some reason. Okay, well, I'll just reset it. Okay, there we go. That's good. Okay, so this is how pretty much how it came in from Helicon Focus. And, you know, I typically lower my highlights to bring out. So let me just zoom in here, look too much. So let me reset. So here I got, I got, you know, I'm always looking at my histogram here. I've got some highlight areas I want to bring back to give that painterly look, bring back my highlights. I usually raise my shadows a bit to bring out that detail. And I just sort of adjust and play with color and, and uh, toning. But, it's, but you know, one thing I always say is I really, really try to get my images in, as close in camera to what I want it to be when, I'm in, uh, when I have my final image. And you can't get it perfectly, of course, but I want to try to be as close as possible. So let me cancel this. And you know, I know this is like a minefield of panels and, and whatnot. I'm, I'm actually going to kind of go through them a little bit. But what we're going to do is I'm going to take you from my layers from the bottom all the way up. Uh, and Linda, please stop me at any time because this is pretty advanced what I'm going to be talking about. And I and you know, it's not like a step by step exactly. So I'm going to generally explain what I do. Okay and tell you what each layer does or, uh, um, so anyway, so here's my, here's my base layer. This is my raw, just like it would take a raw from my camera and I've done some initial processing there and that's what I've got. Now, something interesting happened that I noticed. This was too much detail. The fact that I can see the canvas is actually a problem. And what I found is when I finished this image, and I was gonna post it on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. When this was resized, it created a moiré pattern, you know, kind of like if you 
photograph fine detail, you get that kind of um, weird pattern of like screen doors or mm -hmm. stripes or whatever. So I actually had to go back and get another image where the background was a bit blurry. And that's what this layer is here. And I, let me just show you this. So what I did is I masked out the flowers and the, the, um, the bench. And so now I have a blurry background, but everything else is sharp. So I had to bring that background back. Um, if I, you know, I should have, I just, I just didn't know until it was too late. I'd already done all of this work and I said, okay, well, I'm just going to go grab an image that has a blurry background and I'm just going to Photoshop it back in. And, and that's ended up what I, what I was doing. Now, the other thing you're going to notice is a flower is missing. And the reason why is I wasn't really liking how this flower was drooping here. It looked a little like it was sort of coming out of nowhere, like the stem should have been here or something. It was just a strange angle. And I'm going to turn on my, my armature again. And, you know, this was kind of strange. And I don't know, I kind of wanted it here. So I, I removed it. Okay. And then I brought it back. So now, um, I, if I'm a little all over the place, I apologize. I'm going to just talk about things as I see them. So I have a repair folder. This is typically how I organize my work. It's sort of my workflow. I, I start at the bottom, have a folder for repairing. This is where I do my um, healing, my clone stamping, you know, anything that I need to fix, I do happens in this folder. And one thing I'm going to mention, this is one of the tools here on the side I'm going to talk about. This is a kind of a great little program, little tool uh, panel called Retoucher's Toolkit, which allows me to quickly set up workflows and, and um, do actions that I do often in retouching. I'm going to just make a new file real quick and I'll just show you what it does. So here's like a brand new file. If I click folder setup, it creates all of the folders that I like to use to keep myself organized. So there's my repair folder, my dodge and burn. Then this is fixing saturation, color corrections, and then color grading, which is where I do the overall look. So that's, that's what this weird kind of rainbow colored panel thing is. I'm not going to talk that much about this, but th that's what I use to sort of set up this workflow and then do a couple of other things. Um, so let me go back to, um, okay, is that the right one? No, that's the JPEG. Hold on, I'm going to be here forever. If I, okay. All right, so, so I'm going to turn on, I'm going to turn all these guys off here. Okay, so now we are, uh, I'm going to skip this. That's not worth talking about. I just did something on the pedals here on the left. Okay, so I'm in my repair set. So I'm going to just start going up and turn things on so you can see what happens. So this is my far right flower. So I had moved it down. So now let me turn my my lines back on. So now I made it so that this, this the front of the, the petals here are along this line. So sort of, sort of to complete this triangle. So let me just show you sort of before and after. So that's where the, I moved the flower to and that's where the flower was. So I just shifted that down a bit there. Then, uh, you know, this, this flower was a bit now closer to the bench. And if you look to the left here, there's a reflection from this flower and I thought, you know, it might be nice to add some depth. So I added a, a bit of a reflection here and I just took, took this left flower, flipped it in Photoshop, masked it out, that's the mask here, and uh, kind of gave it a little bit more of a anchoring in sort of space. Uh, and that's what I'm doing. A uh, foreground stem, there's this weird stem here. I, I don't know what, it just looked like it was kind of sad. Uh, so I removed that with a bunch of um, um, sort of healing and cloning and so on. And again, I'll go through all this. And if anybody wants to, me to go back to any particular step, I certainly can. And then I had to remove this uh, blue tape. So that's this layer here. So now the blue tape goes away. 
And then I have a general repair layer. And this is where I'm just kind of fixing things all over the image. So I'm gonna turn this on and off. So, so you can see these um, sort of little smudges and things I get rid of. Um, I think there was some, yeah, this weird brown, this year some scotch tape I had that I was fixing, holding the flowers to the sculpture. So let's see, let's, uh, yeah. So I fixed all that little fuzz or a hair or something there and got rid of, you know, standard type stuff. And so now I've got, you know, with my, my repair layer, things are looking really nice. I've gotten rid of blemishes and such. And then floor, I'm trying to see what I was doing here. Let me see. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. So this was a, um, Yeah, so this was very interesting. This was an artifact from the focus stacking where the bench was reflecting the pattern of the canvas. So I, I didn't like these lines. So I went in there and I cleaned those up with some just simple uh, cloning and healing and whatnot. So that got rid of that. So I re restored some of the wood, wood crane back. So that's what that is. And that is the repair layer. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna to toggle that whole folder off and on for you. So as you can see, you know, I moved my pedals, I got rid of the tape and cleaned up, you know, these blemishes here in the flower um, as well. Okay. So now this, this next uh, group is where kind of a lot of magic happens. This is dodging and burning. And, and I don't know if, people know much about this, but it's a, this is a pretty common technique and all sorts of retouching. And it's where I feel you kind of add that something to your images. I do it a lot in my portrait work. I mean, I spend a lot of my time in my portrait work. That's a whole nother session just about removing blemishes and smoothing out skin and kind of almost sculpting people's faces. Uh, it's, it's sort of, a, it's an incredibly powerful technique, but you can use it in still life as well. So I'm going to turn this off and on so you can see, and you can really see the difference in the highlights, the reflections, the shadows. So this is where I really work to draw people's attention to certain parts of the image. Um, so let me go through the, this folder a little bit. So I'm going to turn off those layers. So here is my dodging. So this is where I'm adding highlights. And dodging and burning are, are um, terms from traditional uh, film photography that you would do in a dark room. So I'm adding lightness. And I just basically do it with a paintbrush. And this is actually kind of interesting. This is what my mask looks like for my dodging. So you can see all the places I wanted to bring out highlights in the image. So one thing I'll kind of note is this bold line down here. What was I doing down there? I wanted, there's a, sort of a, a metal bar or something that supports the top of the bench or the table that this was on. And I just wanted to call it out as like kind of a interesting little detail. So you can see when I turn the, the dodge layer on, that just brings that highlight out because I thought it was just an interesting little detail. And then of course, a lot of the flowers get boosted. Um, you know, let me just zoom in here, I'll show you that. You can see just emphasizing the highlights, you know, especially in the sculpture. And that was a big, big point. Really wanted to bring that out. Okay, so uh, then I didn't like how, how underneath the, the table, it was very dark. So I used another dodge layer to boost the lightness there just to add some depth. So you can see there's this shadow here that's cast and then boosted the highlight underneath the the um the table just adds you know just some interest and then now this is my burn layer so th this is where i am darkening so let's take a look um, at what that that is so these are the areas of my image that i was darkening and as you can see it's a little subtler but you can see i wanted to kind of increase some contrast in there so i just painted in um, some shading, you know, I thought these flowers were too bright, so I 
shaded those up a bit. I mean, you're you're basically painting. I mean, you're you're using your photo as a as a base layer to paint on. And then uh, the lower flower, I had a separate dodge layer just to kind of brighten that one up a little bit. So that's what's going on down there. Nothing, nothing too exciting. Um, so I'm going to turn this off. This is the entire dodge and burn layer or group. And you can see what's going on there. All right. So I don't think I have, oh yeah, okay, so I do. So I do have some areas where I worked on some saturation and color. Now, one of the things that bothered me about this image was the, the table and the sculpture are very similar in color. And I, I wanted to, to have better contrast in color between the sculpture and the table. So what I did in this layer is I muted the color of the wood a bit. So, and then I actually enhanced some of the vibrancy of the brass to bring out that color. So now you're really focused on just the, the centerpiece. So I, it's, it's pretty dramatic. I mean, you know, the, the, the table is this sort of wood orange and I just brought that down. So let me just show you that layer by layer. So this is a vibrancy uh, mass uh, layer. So I masked out, I said, I just want to affect the, the table. So I just lowered my vibrancy and that's really all I did. And then I did the opposite for the sculpture. I actually increased the vibrancy a bit. And that's what this is. You can see, I just kind of loosely painted that. I wasn't being super careful. Um, so that's what I'm doing here with my color. And then this is where, if there's any part of this process where I'm totally undecisive or indecisive, it's this. And this is the color grading. This is when you kind of trying to hone in that final look. This is also a little technical. Um, and, and I kind of work here in, in layer by layer by layer, slightly adding, slightly tweaking. I swear to you, I would not be surprised if this layer actually counteracts this one and they cancel each other out, but that's just the way it is. I just kind of go one by one looking at it. Maybe I won't look at it for a day and I'll come back. And so I'm gonna turn this whole group on. And so there's kind of this, here I see I added this very kind of painterly quality. I'm playing with shadows, um, playing with luminosity mass, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. So, so what a luminosity mask is, so if you're familiar with, with masking, you know, this is a mask. This is saying affect the areas in white, but not the areas in black. And a luminosity mask generates a mask based off of the lightness and darkness of your image. So let me get out of here. Let me show you just very quickly what that is, because I think it's really interesting and it's, and it's super powerful. So um, that actually brings me to this tool here. And this is called Lumenzia, and it generates luminosity masks for me. So I'm gonna, I just wanna show this because it's, it's pretty interesting. So I'm gonna, so these are lights, mids, and darks, and these are different levels of those. So I'm gonna show you. So I'm gonna hit this light. So here is a luminous, luminosity mask, just black and white, based off of my image. Now here I'm gonna go down to L4. So this is a more refined brightness. So now here, I'm just getting the brightest, brightest parts of my image. So let's say I just want to boost the brightest parts of my image, I can do that. So let me, um, um, I'm sorry, we're almost out of time here. I'm, but uh, let me just, I'm, so I'm doing a curves layer. And I'm now going to do a luminosity mask on my curves layer. So let me just do uh, mask and it's uh, generating the mask. It's a big image, but okay. So, so, so there's my mask. So whatever I'm going to do in the curves is going to affect just the lightest, lightest parts of the image. So I'm going to show you that here. So it's going to be very subtle. So let me move this down. Here's my curves. I'm just going to really boost them. It's really subtle. So let me try to do it if I can. Um, I'm sure this doesn't really show on Zoom. So let me move this over here. Let me see, let me turn that off. 
you kind of see it. So that's, that's it with it's on. And now that's off. And you can see the highlights. Let me zoom in here. Just get that little bit of something. And you can go crazy with this. I mean, you can just sit here and play and, but that's what I do. So I use these luminosity masks for the darks, the midtones, the lights, and I'm playing with color and all sorts of things. So let me, let me show you that now. So that, that explains what a luminosity mask is very, very quickly. So let me turn these off and let's kind of go real quick layer by layer. So here's a curves layer. And again, it's funny, this is actually what I just did. It's just boosting the highlights just ever so slightly. So that's what that is. So that's that first one. These are my highlights. Um, and then this is a photo filter. So I took the photo filter here and this is affecting just the darks. Uh, the photo filter is a really great um, uh, filter in, uh, sorry, it's an adjustment layer here under uh, somewhere photo filter. And it's like putting uh, gels over your lights. So I can give things a warm tone or a cool tone. So I went a little warm. And if I want that painterly quality, I go warm. And then I did another curves. This is just to kind of boost, you know, kind of contrast a bit or I'm sorry, less in contrast. Uh, I'm not gonna get into these. This is a little more complicated, but this is called a, this is a color wheel adjustment. Uh, this is another uh, plugin that I have to do sort of advanced color grading, um, but that's for another time. So this just allows me to tint things a little bit. You can barely see it. I mean, I see it on my monitor, but I doubt you all do. I'm gonna turn that on and I did another one of those that was in the darks. So this that sort of a greenish tint and that's it. So that's kind of this, this is where I spend a lot of time and a lot of agony and a lot of, I don't know, and what do I feel like to get to this? And so I'll turn off color grading, turn it on, but it's quite a big difference. So this really gave it that kind of painterly classic kind of, you know, quality. Now, uh, I'm gonna keep going. I add, always add a vignette to my images. Um, there are lots of ways to do that. I'm not gonna get into it. And then what I do is I mask out parts of the image that I don't want the vignette to affect because I don't want my flowers to get darker. I want, the, I want the surroundings to get darker. And this really further adds that kind of painterly quality to the image. So this was it. This was me pretty much set. I was pretty happy with this at this point um, after a lot of back and forth. And then what I do is I merge all my layers together and into this. And then I turn it into a smart object. And the reason why I do that, a lot of people don't know this, but way back here at the beginning when I was in Camera Raw, when I brought in my raw file, well, Camera Raw is actually a filter in Photoshop. You can use it at any time. You don't have to use it just when you bring in an image. So what I do is I merge my image and then I turn it into a smart object because then that means I can go back and change this if I want to. If I do camera raw on a normal layer, it is a destructive process, meaning I cannot go back and change it after I've done it. So I create a smart object and then I run the camera raw filter. And in here, I once again am adjusting things. I'm adjusting contrast, I'm adjusting color. So even this looks pretty different than where I was before. I'm gonna hit okay to that. And now that this is where I end up. So I'm just gonna turn that off so you can see the difference. So it's just playing. There's no rhyme or reason to this. There's no like, I've got some grand plan here. I'm just playing and I'm always changing my mind. Depends on my mood, whatever. Um, so that's the camera raw filter. Then I added a glow, a little bit of a glow to the flowers. And then I, I mean, it's just endless. And then I darkened some of these uh, flowers in the back here. I didn't like how they were sort of, there wasn't a lot of sort of depth. Uh, so if I darken the images, this pushes them a little bit more to the background, really slight and allows these flowers here to come forward. 
And then I added another vignette because why not? Um, and then I added some grain, uh, which just kind of, kind of blends everything together. You can really barely see it actually. Um, it's gonna be impossible on Zoom, but there's some grain in here. You can see that kind of flattens the image a bit. And that is it. That is incredible. So the question is, yeah. about how long did it take you to create this photo from start to finish? Oh, that's a great question. I would say, um, I, I had to put it in terms of actual working time because uh, there was just gaps in between. I would say maybe a day, maybe. I would say the shooting took about 45 minutes uh, to kind of set up the flowers and do that. And then this is the part where I just, I'll spend forever on this. Okay. I mean, really. Um, the day part, uh, is that just your editing is that day? So, oh yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, the, the 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 shooting is the shortest part of the whole thing. I mean, it, it really is. So uh, there's a question, and and she may have missed that you're you're actually in New York. So she wants to know yeah. where do you get your flowers? Oh, there's a fantastic. Um, so if you go to my Instagram, I always credit where I get things from. So this is from Tiny Hearts Farm. They're a fantastic organic uh, little uh, floral farm here in uh, near me in Hillsdale, New York. And they're great. And uh, I know the owner really well. She actually did my wedding. And uh, so I would do these pickups from her every week. I never knew what I was going to get. And that's, that's where I got the flowers from. So I'm skimming through here just to see if there's any big questions. Uh, so somebody did ask, uh, do you calibrate your screen for color? I do. It is super, super, super important. I cannot... Uh, you know, I'm just going to stop sharing for a second. I use a, um, I use a little um, i1 color. Uh, this is a i display, i1 display plus. Uh, you know, absolutely. Okay. I think I've covered all the questions. Um, you generated a whole lot of comments, a lot of amazing a lot of i told you guys he's great so um i'm gonna save this chat because i want you to be able to go back and look at it sure there's just it's just a lot of appreci appreciation for the work you you spent on these images oh, thank you and this is so very different from stuff that i do and i i think a lot of people are just super excited about um learning something new and what was really the word fascinating was used a couple of times is you're showing them behind the scenes you know yeah. your, you know people don't really like to show their messy edits and all the oh. all the stuff they go through and Listen, this was just helpful let i tell this to everybody no one was born knowing how to do this well, no one yeah but you know a lot of people don't share that and so this was yeah. kind of fun for for me i don't do a lot of of Photoshop and now I know why there's a lot of stuff you have to do and a lot of stuff you yeah. have to know and I don't know any of it but um, this is just absolutely I mean I, there's no other word I was I was giddy to have you come on and I'm super just excited that you know you you went through this and um, for me personally, that was the image that stopped me when I was scrolling through my feed because you weren't somebody I was following. You just kind of came into my feed because Instagram thought you might like this. And I did. And I, I very rarely hit those, you know, pictures. I don't know who that is. And I immediately, you know the story, I immediately sent you a message and said, would you do this? And, um, you know, it, it just, I'm tickled and I, I'm so appreciative and this is absolutely generous of you for coming on. Guys, what you don't know is we had another speaker planned for tonight and Douglas Stratton um, is a travel photographer and he had a family emergency. And so I believe it was Monday and I'm like, uh oh, what am I going to do? Yeah. And, and Stephen had said, you know, when I talked to him, uh, we had scheduled him for next year. 
And he says, well, if somebody cancels, let me know. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to reach out and he can say no. And he said, sure. And so for two day turnaround, you put together just, just a fantastic presentation. And I know this takes time. I know that you spent a lot of time to put this together. And oh, it was- thank you. It was just lovely. So oh, thank you. Well, Linda, thank you for having me and thank you everybody. I just I just saw a couple of questions. Gil asked a question if I have any um, Photoshop references. Uh, yes, there I mean YouTube is amazing. And uh, I highly recommend you check out Flern. That's P H L E A R N Flern. Also, there's um, I think it's actually hold on, let me share my screen again real quick. I'm sorry, I know you if you say steam stuff, I've really got to end this. I totally understand, but I just want to, um, let me get out of this. Uh, I just want to make sure I spell this right. This guy's a Pix Imperfect. Yeah, this is him. So this is a Pix, Pix Imperfect. Um, turn that off. So he's, he's fantastic. So I would go with Flern, um, or picks and perfect. That's that's where you want to go. They're great. Highly recommend. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. So let me wrap this up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm. I don't even know what else to say. Um, but this is fascinating and educational and inspiring, and I. I'm just thrilled. I'm absolutely thrilled. So thank you very much. Thank so you. Guys, it was a pleasure. Yeah. So guys, next week, Valerie Hoffman will return. Uh, she was here. Let's see. When was Valerie here? She was here a couple of weeks ago, um, maybe a couple months ago. And uh, so she will be here next week. Her session's called Abstracts in Nature. And she's going to help us look for new ways to create interesting and compelling in images. Her presentation is going to focus on abstracts, and she's going to give us tips on how to search for shapes, lines, patterns, even faces hidden within the scene. Her first class was called Creating Images with Greater Impact, and that is on YouTube on the channel. So check that out. It's through the Happiness Hour link on my website, which is lindanickel.com. And until next Wednesday, Go out, even if it's in your own backyard, um, create something beautiful, and I hope that you'll join us again next Wednesday. So have a good night. Mm -hmm.